Welcome back, everybody. John Aravos is here with Cliff Schechter and our special guest, Kurt Bardella. Uh, Kurt, you guys probably recognize from TV, if you don't. Uh, he is a MSNBC and USA Today contributor, uh, former Republican who now turned Democrat, actually a little bit of a while now. And uh, he worked at the House Oversight Committee for Republicans for years. Um, I'm a former Republican. Daryl Issa, but... I believe. So oh, my yes, God. You were for, you were, right. I was going to ask you, you were with Issa. There that is quite either. a transformation. <laughs> yeah, so Kurt really, really, really could. Well, no, but that's, I always find that very interesting. And I think we could even start with this maybe a quick second about, you know, your transformation. We get into more later, but then I think we wanted to start talking about Biden's speech that just sure. happened that was tremendous. And anybody listening today, please go and Google the speech. It really yeah. it was. Yeah, it was really powerful. Probably good. Um, but Kurt, I think I, Kurt actually, uh, to, hmm. to start with it, I just saw Kurt's tweet where he said, Today's the day that Joe Biden became president, which I think is about right. That's how I, you know, came away of thinking. Um, as expected, you know, Vice President Biden struck the right tone, um, you know, said the right things, talked about unity um, in the in the wake of the divisiveness that President Trump is is really sowing throughout the country, and it it was made even more powerful by what we saw yesterday from from Donald Trump uh, in that pathetic display of, I don't even know what you call it to be quite, I mean, it was uh, just embarrassing for, 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 for Trump, for our country. Uh, and, and, and I was so heartened to see uh, a return of, of, of decency and of, of, of a human being. And the thing that makes Biden so powerful, I've always felt, is that this is someone who uh, has lived through a lot of grief in his life, which which he touched on. You know, this being you know uh, the fifth anniversary of his son's death, uh, who, who you know, lost his battle with cancer. Uh, you know, Biden's life, as much success as he's had politically, has been uh, interwoven with personal tragedy. Yeah. And in a time like this, with what we're seeing unfold in this country, I think that this the people need a leader that they can relate to on some level. Right. And no matter what you believe politically, right, left, conservative, liberal. Probably a Democrat. I, I think that anyone who who has watched Joe Biden throughout his career, and certainly anybody who saw his speech today, believes that that this is someone who who actually believes what he says. That he is authentic. He's not trying or pretending to be uh, the consoler in chief, the right. healer in chief. I don't think he could help himself if he wanted to. Like, I mean, this he is just, just who he's... he is. Like yeah. he has a natural empathy that uh, derives from the things that he's experienced in his own life. And that really comes across when, when, when he gives a speech like that. And, and you contrast that to uh, the insanity that we saw unfold yesterday, uh, which I, I still don't even know what to, I mean, there are no, literally there are no words to, 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 to aptly describe what yesterday yep. was other than uh, the, the, the rantings of a lunatic sociopath who is completely unfit to serve in the office that he holds. Um, and, you know, and, I was trying to find the words too, yeah. and especially the clearing of people out of the way like they were sheep, you know, oh for a photo op on American soil. Yeah. Well, you yeah. know, I wanted to make one. I was telling Cliff before the show about this. As somebody who I consider myself an agnostic, I guess I was raised Greek Orthodox. I'm still not totally atheist, you know, so I'm still not in the religion is the spaghetti monster zone yet. Um, but you know, I'm, I, agnostic is a good word for me. I don't go to church. Um, I saw Trump doing that. And one of the things that hit me, you know, as a Christian watching it was if you're going to be totally obnoxious about this and just say, I'm going to a freaking church and I'm going to hold a Bible up and I'm going to throw it in these Democrats and these blacks and these everybody else's faces to say, you tried to burn this church last night. If I'm, and you know this as a former Republican too. First of all, part of you is going to legitimately be pissed off that the church was set on fire the night before. Part of you is going to be so opportunistic, you know you're going to say, do you know what they did to this church? But it still stands. The Democrats couldn't mm -hmm. burn it down. And holding the Bible, you're going to mention the Bible. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to pray because it's going to be great TV. He didn't do any of he that. He can't because, even pull that off. Well, I know. No, but, but Cliff, and the reason, and, and Kurt, I'll throw it back to you. The reason he couldn't do any of that is because... He doesn't believe in any of this stuff. He doesn't care about the church. He doesn't care about Christianity. <laughs> he doesn't care about the Bible. It didn't even hit him to say a prayer, to mention that the reason you're at the church is it was on fire the night before. Like, it freaks a lot of us out in D.C. I don't know how long you've lived here, Kurt, but that church is really famous. You know, for all, oh, the yeah. presidents, all the presidents but Trump going there. And it just it was another sort of layer to just 
how conniving just and just fraud soulless he is. and fraud. Yeah, like how yeah. soulless he is. Well, I think it also shows that the, the the little regard he actually has for people of faith, and yeah, to, the, the, that he thinks that he can con them yeah. into believing that he is some kind of Christian. <laughs> uh, you know, when, when it was so painfully obvious, just by everything, his demeanor, uh, his words, the, the embarrassing photo op with the Bible. And um, not even mentioning the Bible. He can't even hold weird, the Bible. He just held like, it up there. Uh, he uh, well, he was holding before? it like it was going to, like it was burning him. He was holding exactly. it in corners. I mean, he's like, he's like that, I need to drop it. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought that, you know, it, it was actually it, yeah. one of the more effective lines from Biden's speech was, you know, rather than hold it up, maybe it would serve him well to read it and, and actually, you know, Great look at line, what's yeah. in the Bible. Um, because it's clear that, that, that Donald Trump has never done that. Uh, and, and just the, the, I think the, the cynicism of trying to use the church as, uh, as such a prop, um, you know, it, it, it's insulting. And, but hasn't and, it worked for him? Let me interrupt you, though. Hasn't it worked? Clearly, the religious right has bought in. We've all seen the pictures of the crazy evangelical leaders all holding their hands on Trump's shoulder and closing their eyes as if as if he's like really, you know, he's sitting there in his head going, get your hands off of me. I mean, he's con. But that's, can I jump in for a sec? John? Yeah. I would say that's not because of photo ops in front of churches. That's not because they believe he believes. It's because he hates the right people. And he's shown the, the frauds that they are. I mean, right. there are true ev- evangelicals. There's the one from the, the what's the, uh, the, the really big evangelical publication, the most famous one who stepped oh, down and said, yeah. I can no longer work yeah. here because I, 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 I actually an evangelical and supporting Trump is, is horrifying. But you have these second generation or third generation of little preacher babies, you know, the Falwells and, mm-hmm. you know, and others who are just who are complete corrupt frauds. And so they don't care. It has nothing to do with religion. It has to do with control. It has to do with money. It has to do, you know, I mean, that's my, just, that's what's occurred. But my point but is, I worry feeling. that these photo ops help him in that regard with the crazies. Because you he's know, got a picture in front of a church. Look at Trump holding a Bible. Hold but on. he's got them already. And, and the thing is, it's like, uh, and when it comes to the crazies, I, I, I don't care. Like, they're going to vote how they're going to vote. We all know True. that. That's not going to change anything. Uh, what Trump is doing, though, by appealing only to the crazies, uh, is cutting himself off from everybody else. And for every crazy voter that he holds on to, he's losing uh, a voter that he's actually going to need to win the next election. I mean, right. for all the talk about 2020 and all of the talk about 2016, lost in the conversation is always the fact that we had an election in 2018. And it was an overwhelming repudiation of Donald Trump, the Republican Party. 40 Republican seats became Democrat seats, places that haven't seen a Democrat in office in places like Southern California ever. Yeah, right. went, Orange County completely. went to the Democratic Party. Yeah, you know, the district that my former boss Daryl Issa used to work, represent is now held by a Democrat. Right. So, yeah, you know, and this is a district that we routinely went by double digits without even having to, frankly, run a campaign. Uh, you know, in, in the last decade, so that, that just tells you that Trump is so fixated, I think, on 2016 that he and his uh, allies completely have missed the lessons of the 2018 midterm elections have refused to recalibrate at all instead of trying to expand and, and, and try to uh, grow his voting coalition. He's actually narrowed it and made it even smaller. And yeah. that is just not a recipe for electoral success. You look at the, the group of voters that were so important and meaningful for him to win in 2016 against Hillary Clinton, uh, suburban voters, women voters, uh, you know, uh, college Over educated 65 voters. 65 even he's, he's, you know, he's hemorrhaging. Uh, and, he is upside down in every single one of those demographics. And when he does what he did yesterday, that does not help him there. Uh, I think that yesterday was the beginning of the end of his presidency. Hmm. You know what my theory is too, John? Yeah. I'll say quickly. Yeah. You know, came out, I believe it was the Wall Street Journal, one of these places reported, of course, that he's consulting with Karl Rove because, of course, right? Rove is one back in the game forever. And You know, Rove, as a young guy, his first campaign, I believe, was the Nixon reelection in 72, which was all about law and order. And, you know, these these, you know, blacks in the city are terrible and they're destroying everything. And I mean, racism throughout. And I would say that the thing is about Karl Rove, which he was bestowed this genius who actually almost found a way to to, to lose 2000 because he's obsessed with being in California (laughs) instead of in Iowa. The last couple I mean, I go on about Rove and the supposed genius. The thing is, is that 
Rove, it seems that he's, he, you know, I believe Rove has told him this and he's trying to run a re, you know, rerun of, you know, of 1972. The problem is, is that the liberals, you know, the, I'm sorry, the suburbs, the inner suburbs are much more liberal. The, you know, the people who are showing up at these rallies are much more mixed race as opposed to 1968 mm-hmm. and those times when it was almost 90% plus African American. We're just not the same country anymore. You know, and not at all. And I and that yeah, and that's what that's the problem. So my guess is is that whole Bible thing is all about a Carl Rove type play of that's how you win back voters in the suburbs. That's how you win back voters over sixty five. You're losing because frankly they know that you'd let them die for the economy with coronavirus. And, we, and I don't think it's going to work. That's I, we're a different country. That's my feeling. I agree with you. I, I think that again, running and Trump is a man that's that's trapped in a different time in many ways from what we've seen. You know, he's never gotten past the point where where we in our country did you know integration and uh, where, where we expanded the women's role from being more than just a secretary or outside of the kitchen. He's right. he's trapped in in, in 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 a year era gone by. Uh, and, and you know, if if Donald Trump wants to put his reelection chances on the back of Karl Rove, God bless, you know, good, because he'll lose. <laughs> um, you know, the, running, running a campaign as if it's 1972 uh, in 2020 is a recipe for failure. It is uh, a completely different country when you look at, I mean, the reality is in 15 years, we're going to be a majority minority country uh, in, in America. And we are more diverse uh, than, than, than ever before. And that, and that, that you know, to know how this story ends, all you have to do is look at what actually happened to the California Republican Party. Right. In the mid-90s, the Republican Party in California was thriving. They had a majority in state legislature. They had a Republican governor, uh, Republicans in statewide offices. And just two decades later, they're pretty much extinct. Not a single Republican in statewide office. Most of the time, they could even field a Republican to run. Democrats have a super majority, a veto-proof majority in state legislature. The congressional districts have pretty much all flipped to being a Democrat. And you look right. at how- and the ones that were gerrymandered too, because they figured they could always hold the suburbs, right? Right. And it's like you look at everything that the Republican Party in California has done to get them to where they are now, and uh, basically it is a third party. Uh, it is behind Democrats and decline of states and independents in, in the state of California voter registration, and they embraced a xenophobic agenda, targeted Hispanics, uh, you know, began running to the extreme right. And, and, and a couple election cycles of doing that, and they've now put themselves into an irrelevant position. That is where I believe the Republican Party nationally is headed by embracing this radical, extreme Trump agenda. Uh, it, you know, it might have gotten them some success temporarily, but the damage to the Republican Party will be felt long after Donald Trump is out of office. That's such yeah. a smart point, too. I'll just quickly say, because Orange County was once literally almost the, the center of the Republican Party. You know, it produced Nixon, it produced Reagan, it produced Pete Wilson, who was mm-hmm. going to be potentially a national figure and all. And, and now, because people think of California now, they think of how liberal it is. And they don't realize that a lot of that's because, yes, the, the states moved to the left, but also the Republican Party moved so far to the right that, you know, and that I think you're, that metaphor for the country as a whole is, is right on. I, you know, I mean, my sort of take on this, and then we're going to do a quick ad break, but just for a quick second. I still, I hope you two are right. You're more, both of you are a little more optimistic than I am. My fear is twofold with what's going on right now. One, we've taken the, not we, the coronavirus is now out of the picture for now. Now the virus isn't going away. So it's clearly going to come back in the news at some point. So Trump can't just make it go away forever in terms of a news story showing how incompetent he is, right? You know, that's the good, I don't want to say the good side. It certainly isn't the good side that it's coming back. But he clearly can't get rid of the story forever, but it does benefit him to get rid of it now. Secondly, I worry about, A, you take protests of liberals and you try to scare people that, oh, those scary liberals, look at them marching in your cities. Then you take the fact that we have had a lot of looting nationwide. And I don't think they're the protesters, but nonetheless, you've got those images. And it's as knowing my Republican playbook, I say, you know, Trump is sitting there and Karl Rove and all the rest of them, you know, Brad Parscall are salivating that, that they're getting these images on TV they can use. And I fear when, when you start to scare the American people with violence and then throw in a racial, uh, racist argument in there, I get a little worried as I'm not sure what's coming next in terms of how voters are going to take it. I don't know. If, if you want to answer really quick, Kurt, on that, then we'll do a really quick break and then we can continue. You know, I, I hear what you're saying. 
and and there there is some logic to that because we've seen in the past it's worked. Fear has worked for the Republican Party. I mean, if you could brand the Republican Party in one word, it is the word fear. Um, I just don't believe, based on what we saw in 2018, uh, that that's going to work right now. Uh, and I think that more than anything, people are just tired of of of, of all the noise. Yeah. And no matter what you believe ideologically, I think that there is a fatigue factor when it comes to Trump. And and, and a lot of people think, well, we tried that. We thought blowing up, you know, the bringing in the outside of it, that that would shake everything up and it would be great. Turns out it won't, because at the end of the day, no matter what is in the news cycle, tens of millions of Americans are out of work right now, not getting a paycheck. Uh, and, and when that's the case, that that's the case for change. And I think that will play heavily by the time we get to November. Um, which should we start with? I mean, should we, t- you know, I guess, Kurt, that is true. Let's talk a little bit about what happened. I mean, Daryl Issa, for both folks who don't know, that's pretty far right. I mean, as far as pretty conservative member of Congress or was, um, what happened? What was your epiphany? You know, it's, it's always interesting when I hear people characterize Daryl as this far right Um <laughs> Because I've always looked at him, when you actually look at his record, it's anything but that. Now, more recently in the Trump era, he has adopted far-right extremist insane rhetoric, just as the entire Republican Party has. But before that, this is a guy who came out for comprehensive immigration reform. This is a guy who came out, uh, who, who was uh, for you know, gay rights, someone who... Uh, being was it, from, did he, was it, what, yeah. was he, what was he doing on gay rights? I had no clue. What was he supportive of? Uh, he was uh, he was against the whatever the initiative was that was trying to define marriage as only between a man and a woman. He was up in California at the time. Wow. Uh, he, he came out against that. Oh wow. Okay. I didn't um, know. He also um, was good on. If I, I think he was a much more let's at least call it moderate, right, on Arab Israeli relations because of his background. Oh, very much so. He being Lebanese, right. yeah. Um, you know, right. uh, so the idea that Daryl was this ideologue is actually I've always felt inaccurate. What he was was a fierce partisan. Okay. And people interpreted his role as the, as the head of oversight government reform, doing all these investigations as somehow that, that, you know, that, that, that is an ideology. That's not, that has nothing to do with being conservative it's opportunism, or liberal. Right? No, that's uh, interesting. You know, that's very interesting. You know, it, it's being a partisan, right. uh, which he was a, a fierce one. Uh, right. Not saying that's good or bad, but that's what he was. Okay. Take us back to you again now. So, I mean, fair enough on the correction. So what, what happened for you? Well, for me, uh, you know, I, I, a couple of things. You know, number one, the 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 rise of Trumpism in the in the 2016 campaign uh, was disturbing. I mean, again, you, when you have someone literally calling um, Mexicans drug dealers and rapists, when he's attacking, uh, you know, uh, reporters who have a disability, when he is, uh, you know, seeing this, you know, sowing these seeds of of hate and blatant racism. Um, I don't care what you think about taxes or jobs or the healthcare system like once you kind of go there i i, I don't want to be a part of that right and, and 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 as i watch the republican party fall in line behind that and not speak out against it and not do anything meaningful to protest this incendiary dangerous uh, rhetoric that was a uh, a real eye opening thing to see and so i made the decision uh, that this was a party that I no longer wanted to be affiliated with. And, and so I made the decision in early uh, 2016 to, 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 uh, that I was going to support Hillary Clinton for president, which was a part, as someone who spent a good amount of time uh, you know, being a part of the committee that was investigating. <laughs> Where were you a- working? Like, in other words, were, were, were you still, I know it's awesome, were you still in Republican <laughs> politics at that point? When you, because that must have been an you awkward know, I, sort of announcement. Then. I, 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 I am, yeah, you know, no. it, it, I had fast started, and furious. Oh, but I'm for Hillary. <laughs> <laughs> I had started transitioning more into the role of political commentator. Part of uh, what I decided was important from a credibility standpoint was to put myself in a place where I wasn't uh, taking anyone's money that was in the political space, uh, where I could be free to say what I th- what I felt uh, without having worrying about who was paying my bills. Right. And uh, you know, everybody that you know, so many people that are a part of the, you know, that you see on TV, that are consultants, like everybody answers to somebody. Uh, That's and, true. And, and so you have to always calibrate the sincerity of what they're saying based on how, how it affects their interests and their bottom line. And yeah. for me to be able to go out there and say, I'm not bought and paid for by anybody. I'm not taking right. anybody's money right now. So what I say is what I believe, and I'm backing that up uh, by not taking anyone's money. 
uh, which was probably financially and professionally a stupid thing to do, but that's just, that's, yeah. that's where I was at. Welcome to um, the left, Cliff, Kurt. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't get rich. <laughs> Even if you want to take people's money, we don't have any. That's right. right. So Good luck that, taking money. <laughs> that, I think, gave me more credibility to be able to speak out and, and, and get the type of uh, right. opportunities that I've had. Um, and then as we just, uh, 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 Can as I, I begin- something quickly? I don't want to cut you, but weren't you at, were you, you were at Breitbart as a spokesperson, right? Isn't that I, correct? They were one of my clients. I was consulting I for them. It's a client. Cause I felt yeah. like, and tell me if I'm wrong, but I felt like when that whole Corey Lewandowski thing went down, you spoke out. Yeah, that was really what, that was kind of the, the igniter of, hmm. of, of it all for me, because I felt like I was being put in a position where I was going to have to lie well, wait, uh, tell to people protect what, Corey Lewandowski. Tell what happened really. So Corey was a campaign manager for the Trump campaign at this time. And he got into an altercation, a physical altercation with, the, with, with one of Breitbart's own reporters, Michelle Fields, where he grabbed her. Uh, and, of course, they fiercely denied that it happened. Michelle had bruises on her arm, so it did happen. Uh, the videotape corroborated that it did happen. And yet uh, Breitbart was undermining her. And for me, just as a professional, like, you want me to go out there and try to sell everyone that you, that you take this seriously and that you're uh, you know, going to support your own reporter, but really what you're doing is undermining her every step of the way. I didn't remember talking. she actually had bruises on her arm. Yeah. She I didn't did. remember that. Wow. And he so assaulted uh, her that, you know, that, like a day or two later, I just made the decision to, to quit. I said, you know what, I'm no longer going to represent you. This, this, uh, isn't, isn't for me. Uh, and, uh, and that was that. That's when I first saw your name. That was when I first noticed. I remember when I saw that you had done that, I'm like, wow, somebody, who's been a Republican for you know a long time is actually speaking out and doing the right thing. I mean, that was a very cool moment. We had a few of them during that campaign, not enough. Yep. Yeah, and, and, you know, and, and so that was, uh, I'll never understand this. Breitbart decides to attack me and, and put out this narrative that I'm a, I'm a, I'm a terrible uh, PR person for bailing on them in their time of need. I'm, you know, and, and, and you know, my approach was, our working relationship is over and I'm moving on and you can move right. on. And that's that I wasn't going to talk about you. But when you start attacking me, well, okay, now I have to defend myself. Right. And so that night I made my first appearance ever on CNN with Don Lemon. Hmm. And Don asked me point blank. So is Breitbart lying when they're saying that they're standing behind the reporter? And I just said, yep, they're lying. Hmm. And Don goes quiet for like 15 seconds. And I'm thinking <laughs> something's wrong with the audio. Like maybe <laughs> I'm just like, I, I, I wasn't sure. I, I this I was very new at TV at this. Hello, point. hello, Don. And, and Don finally says, "I'm sorry. Uh, people generally don't just come out here and just tell the truth." <laughs> I know they're like, "You just were honest." What is this TV? Uh, yeah. Come on. And so uh, and and that moment went viral, and uh, yeah, I became a regular on Don's show at that point in time, and, right. and started you know just talking about what was going on because no matter again what what side of the aisle you're on, I've always felt that there there was some fundamental misunderstandings about how the right operates and what what motivates them and uh, how they weaponize what they do and how Democrats, frankly, are really bad at dealing with that. Um, yep. And never imagining that Trump would become the nominee, that then he would win, that Steve Bannon would become his right-hand guy. It's like all of these things kept happening where the only person who had actually had firsthand experience with these people who could talk about it honestly was me. And so kind of this unlikely, you know, career in political commentating began through that. Right. And at the same time, for the first time, I was having conversations with Democrats about issues that I frankly had never really thought about before. Like shocking as this may be, Republicans don't sit around and talk about gun reform or climate change or, or social right. inequality or uh, any of the, the issues that we, that we hear about so much now. They just never really came up in, 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 in my life. And so I never really thought about them, had an informed opinion one way or the other about them. And as I began talking to people more and exploring those issues, I, you know, I find myself on the side of the Democrats on a lot of issues. Right. And finally, one day, my wife says, you know, on like 99% of the issues out there, you're a Democrat. You should just kind of call yourself that. And so uh, uh, abiding to her wisdom, as she is much smarter than I am, certainly, uh, I uh, made the formal an announcement uh, or wrote in a USA Today column that I was uh, going to become a Democrat. Let me ask you, because as a, as a former Republican, some I wanted to ask you basically on why more Republicans aren't speaking out, whether you've been surprised. What has really bothered me 
has been particularly on national security, which is something that, you know, my views haven't changed that much in the last 30 years from where they were before in national security. And watching Trump with Putin, especially, mm-hmm. but also watching him with China. And you can, you can even get into trade and some of the other issues where Trump's views are anathema to Republican ideology, but particularly national security dealing with Russia. That's the kind of thing where, I, you know, it, it enrages me and not as a partisan, but as an American, I see what he's doing. I see Don Jr. God, I mean, I, I would almost say for me, the biggest crime of, of, the, of the Trump era in a way is Don Jr. saying, I love it when the Russian government says they want to help him win the election and he accepts. I mean, as a former Republican and as a current American, I I don't want to downplay anything else that's happened, but that almost is worse than anything because to me it's treasonous. And the idea of other Republicans not speaking out, what the hell do you think is going on? Why are there not more people? I don't mean like you where they become Democrats, but where like David Frum, they just say, what is wrong with you people? You know, it's funny. There was a, an item in uh, Axios where Mike Allen had a quote from a senior administration official who expressed uh, their displeasure with what happened with the protesters. And, 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 and every time Anonymously. I read those, course, I, read those right. I think, you chicken shit. Like, yeah. you know, if you really are unhappy or uncomfortable with what's happening, then, then, then quit and say so. Um, you know, I did it. And, it's, yeah. it, you know. So I know it's not hard to do that, to do the right thing. And if more people did that, we wouldn't be in the condition that we're in right now in this yeah. country. And you know, I, I am perplexed as to the, how the Republican Party has allowed Trump to hijack them and turn them into these right-wing conspiracy theory puppets for a foreign country that does not have our best interest at heart. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they, and, and which the Republican Party knows. You don't have to explain to Republicans why Russia and Putin are bad. Right. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. I mean, up until Trump, they were the ones leading the chorus that Russia right. was bad. They're the ones who would attack President Obama for being Mitt Romney, for 2012. Right. Romney, things. actually. <laughs> um, he was right. <laughs> yeah. You know, and so that's why I always say, like, I never want to hear the bullshit that the Republican Party is a party of national security. They've sold out our national security. I never want to hear that the Republican Party is the party of pro-life, when they're the ones saying, you know what, if 100,000 Americans are dead because of the coronavirus, that, that's acceptable. That's but, why is, why is it ha- but why is it happening? Why aren't people speaking out if it's so obvious that these are violations of Republican Because they ideas? don't believe in any actual ideology. They believe in one ideology, and that's the ideology of power. Hmm. And uh, the, the, the rhetoric you have heard from Republicans up until Trump of small government, living within your means, Fiscal responsibility, lower deficits, uh, you know, n- n- no debt, uh, you know, pro- sanctity of life, every life matters. Uh, all that, like that was all crap. Like they don't mean that. They're right. they're pretending. They're 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 playing their their base for a bunch of suckers. I mean, the the level of disdain. This is the ultimate irony. The level of disdain that, that these people have for their voters. The way uh, if they if the people in Middle America only knew how 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 their leaders how the people that they're you know, wearing their MAGA hats for how they really feel about them oh yeah they would beat the shit out of yeah. them yeah you know? diamond I mean, it, and it, silk it, it, you know you know this imagine what most Republicans think of diamond and silk right you know this. come on I mean yeah right. so it's 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 really um <laughs> I'll, I'll be one of the most interesting things will be what happens God willing that Joe Biden wins. And, 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 and let's, let's say that Biden wins and the Senate goes with him, uh, that, that they pick up this, you know, because things are looking really strong, I think, for Democrats in the Senate as well. Uh, in places like Arizona, Colorado, North Carolina, Maine, uh, you know, there, there's a real opportunity for Democrats to take back the Senate. Even in Georgia, both and, seats and, are looking, you know. And retire Mitch McConnell, hopefully. Um, oh, God. What the Republican Party does at that moment uh, will be very telling because one of two things is going to happen. They're either going to continue to go to the far right and not learn from failure and follow the path of the California Republican Party, right. or they're going to dump everything associated with the Trump era and try to pretend like it didn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. Convince, you will see people, and this is what I think will happen. You will see people like the Lindsey Grahams, uh, like the Paul Ryan, people who, who, who will say, well, we privately were, vi- we, we were trying to stop this. We were, we were trying to, you know, it's going to, it's going to turn out that, that Kellyanne Conway was the anonymous writer of the, of the New York times op-ed that was, uh, you know, 
lamenting everything happening in, in, in the Trump White House, you're going to see people rewrite history and try to make it look like that they were not a part of this. Yeah. And I don't think that's going to work. But it's going to be very entertaining to watch them do those backflips. Well, no, what they will get away with, I'm sorry, Cliff, one quick second. What they will get away with is they will absolutely accuse President Biden of every single thing Trump did 10 times worse. And with a straight face, they'll do it. And I worry, again, I'm the worry wart of the team here, but I worry they're going to get away with it because generally speaking, I've always had much more admiration for how Republicans message than Democrats. Oh Not, my God, you know, a thousand the, percent. The, I bang my head against the wall yes. watching Democrat messaging. Yes, it is. Democratic I, you, messaging, Kurt. Democrat. Oh yes, yes. I, <laughs> God, why that's even a thing, I'll never, that, that right there tells you. <laughs> it's hard to get rid of, I know. With, with, with the <laughs> Democratic <laughs> Party. We had um, Joe Walsh on, he did it too. It's all good. Oh he did it, and Kurt, we, Kurt, Kurt, we, Kurt, I reminded yeah. him too. Click so, you know, and people were like, thank you. I was so upset when I heard that. <laughs> Jesus, it's like, you know, if- But that's if, a good example. If the Democrats had one, the one thing that gives me help, heartened, is right. Rick Wilson, Steve Schmidt, uh, George Conway, what they're doing, Project Lincoln. Because that's how you message. What they, what you're like, and, it's, <laughs> and I've always said, I've said this before, it, Take some Republicans to beat Republicans. I was going to say, the best Democratic messengers are Republicans, is what you're saying right now. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and thank God they're doing what they're doing because they're showing this is how you beat them. This is how you beat them at their own game. Well, you take yeah. it to them. You don't, you that's know, what, not that's what it's of... going to take. The, you know, Democrats so often, I feel like, uh, and the Democratic primary was a good example of this. Hmm. The idea that this election is somehow going to actually come down to who's for Medicare for all or not. No, it's not. Yeah. The idea that who has a, the best plan for 45 different issues matters. Yeah. No, it doesn't. If substance mattered, Donald Trump wouldn't be within smelling distance of the White House, nevertheless living in it right now. Right. Uh, you know, know what you're up against. And it was so frustrating watching the Democratic Party debates because the whole time they're litigating a case against one another that has nothing to do with beating Donald Trump. Um, right. I and, mean, again, you know, in, in, in fairness, I get why people were so... I would say anal about Medicare for all, because, you know, it, you do want the best proposal to win. I mean, I on gay rights, LGBT rights, I would push for my proposal and I didn't like people watering it down. So I get that. But as you said, I've always felt that Americans put aside the left. Americans tend to vote for the guy and it's the guy, the guy they like, the guy they want to have a beer with, the guy they want to go fishing with and against the, the against the woman they hate. But I mean, it's, right. it's pretty simple primal instincts here. But I'll tell you, the interesting thing that's also not being, I think, calculated for as people look at 2020 is there were, a, for better or worse, a lot of people who voted for Trump because they just couldn't stand the thought of voting for Hillary Clinton. Correct. There's no doubt. And the right. level of, Some hatred, of it, yeah. you know, and, and being former Republicans, you know, you know this, the level of hatred for the Clintons is very real and visceral yeah. within the Republican Party. Uh, and, well, and, and, and that's, not her, and that's not her of, fault. And, 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 30 years of Vince Foster messaging and all that and let's stuff. let's be clear, too. Look, Hillary Clinton didn't do herself any favors there either, frankly. I mean, I, I'll say without question, the investigation of Benghazi was all bullshit. I mean, that it was all political messaging. Right. But nobody forced her to have a private email server in her basement. Well, and she, you know what? She gave shitty answers on it is the bigger problem. Because you know what? Like how they did, did not put Powell that to bed. It. Bush White House did yeah. it. But she didn't sit here and go, you know what? Yeah, I'm as guilty as Colin Powell in the Bush White House. Right. She, she never, my concern with Hillary, not to relitigate that, was I think she's a, she would have, somebody told me the other day, she would have been an amazing president, but she, I don't think she was a great candidate. I don't think she spoke well publicly, and I don't think she was able to. Elizabeth Warren, God bless her, I love Elizabeth Warren, has this problem too. She's very, she has a hard time taking bullshit scandals thrown against her and concisely telling you it's bullshit and putting it to right. bed. Well, look how hard it was for Warren to deal with the stupid Pocahontas crap. That's what I'm saying. It's bullshit, um, but she should have been able to, nope. she looked uncomfortable discussing it. And the thing that always perplexed me about the Clinton thing was, the first time that, and I can say this because I was there, we sent at the oversight committee hmm. a letter to her about the email stuff. It was in 2013. Hmm. It was three years before she, she was going to be the nominee. Right. How between that time, if you know you're going to run for president, which she, of course, did, how do you not put that to bed? Yeah. <laughs> but but, but yeah, it's yeah. like, I mean, come on. So yeah. I always say it's like part of this was was the ineptitude of the campaign, we'll say. Yeah. Although I don't, I don't want to get on too long about 
the problems of 2016. But, I mean, but, but my point being that those problems and that visceral, I think, hatred that, 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 that the party had for, for Hillary, that does not exist for Joe Biden. Ah, got gotcha. right. you. Okay. Biden right. is not going to have that barrier. As right. I said, when we started this conversation, Biden comes off as genuine and authentic and likely. Yep. Even if you hate every policy he ever talks about, yep. you still like the guy. Right. I, think right. the, I think a lot of it's sort of the compassion that, you know, that comes from him is quite obvious. He seems like a regular guy. Joe you know Biden I mean? is the only Democrat I've ever heard any Republicans say, I'd vote for him. You know, he just, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a different ball game with okay, him. Explain to people on the left why what you just said now is not obscene. <laughs> I'm, I'm quite serious. I think there will be some supporters of some candidates who say that's exactly the problem with Joe Biden, that he's a Democrat Republicans would vote for. Yeah, and, 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 to, and whoever says that should never be involved in professional politics because <laughs> talking you has to win. Me, me to believe at the end of the day. The only thing that matters is who can get 50 plus one, if you will, who can get the most votes. And I'm for the candidate that can get as many votes from all places as possible. And I've always said, you can't beat something with nothing. If you don't give disaffected Republicans someone to take a look at, if you don't at least try to reach out to them, then you are giving them no choice but to vote for Donald Trump. You have got to give them an alternative. And it was you know, during the Democratic nomination process, the only two candidates that I felt spoke to those people were Joe Biden and Pete Buttigieg. Mm-hmm. And, and they understand when you look at, as much as I wish as it was the case, presidential elections aren't popularity contests. It's not who gets the most votes. If that were, Hillary Clinton be president right now. She got three million more votes than Donald Trump. It's who can put together the electoral co- coalition and particularly who can do well in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Florida. And when I look at the electoral map and you look at who those voters are, who those constituencies are, you're going to have to reach out to some white working class voters. That's just the the electoral reality. Well, Biden won a lot of those folks disproportionately, like you saw in primaries. He did so well in some of those rural areas. And I get it. Those are Democrats voting. But some of those were switchover votes, too. Right. And there's you a know? reason why, frankly, Barack Obama put Joe Biden on the ticket in 2008, right. uh, you know, yep. being the first black president, you know, a, a, a situation where more than any time in our history, the color of the candidate's skin was going to be one of the first two things you thought about when you cast your vote at, uh, at, the, uh, you know, at your ballot at the, at the voting office there. And having Biden on the ticket because he plays well in those key states made a difference and they won twice. Like, you know, it's like of all the people running for, for office, Biden gets to say, I know what it takes to win presidential elections because he was on the ticket for two successful ones. No one else right. can say that. I've said this is a while and I'll just say again quickly. I mean, look, I, I live in Cincinnati. So, you know, I, I think I can speak to it, which is there's a suburban, you know, Procter and Gamble type moderate Republican that Biden appeals to while at the same time appealing to some of these voters we lost that are white working class, rural. I mean, he does. He has a, a wide appeal, and, and I think that's going to be hugely helpful. It's a reason why right now Ohio is a swing state again, mm-hmm. quite frankly. And let's be clear, too. It is very easy, I think, for white voters to feel just alienated from the political process right now, especially in, in the context of these conversations we're having about race. Uh, and, and, and because the, the people who have perpetrated some of these horrific acts are white, uh, you know, you have to have a candidate who can also reach out to white people and, and invite them to be a part of the solution to some right. of the things that we're talking about right now. Right. And I think Biden understands, you know, again, his speech d- did that, you know, and, and, and he talked about healing and he talked about uh, solutions and, and coming together. Uh, to, to, to create a better world for everybody of all, you know, creeds, colors, et cetera. And that's, that, that's just an important component to, I think, what it's going to be to, to be uniquely to defeat Donald Trump. You, uh, you know, any other election, you know, it, 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 it would be very different. And Biden wouldn't even be the nominee, in my opinion, if it, if it weren't for this particular moment in time. Yep. But, you know, it's, it's, but it's, Republicans it's, have, tr- have traditionally been very, very good at messaging to white voters. There's a reason for that. We all know. Uh, but Democrats can't just, again, abandon them and not give them a reason to show up and vote. Because uh, if they do, 
they'll lose. We saw that, that, that. I mean, that's what happened in 2016. We can't have that happen again. Right. I mean, I've argued for a long time. The only thing is, you know, I don't have data backing it up, but I had wished that the candidates had focused more on simply, it's not just time for a change. It's time for an adult to enter the room. And aren't you just sick of all of this? You know, and right. it's just sick of the anger, sick of, sick of, forget even now, sick of the riots, not the riots, but I mean, the, you know, the police brutality, sick of the economy crashing, sick yep. of the disease, but just coronavirus. That's why my whole thing at this point is just the tagline should simply be something along the lines of had enough. Well, you that's what I mean. And, 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 but even like, before. You want more, you want more Twitter. Correct. Rates, you want more coronavirus. You Correct. Want more, I mean, and actually, you know what, Cliff, you and I were saying that a year ago had, and this is another Republican messaging point. You hit a point again and again and again. And guess what? If you keep talking about it every day, once every three months, some disaster is going to pop up that reinforces your point. So have right. we been That's saying exactly right. for a year, haven't and you with had Trump, enough? it's more like once every two weeks. So. But, 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 but the messaging point, haven't you had enough? Then it would have been, oh my God, the virus. Then it would have been all the racism and the violence. Right. It, all of this would have fed into a larger, and Biden, for me- You create a narrative structure with your messaging, yeah. and then you fit- everything right. into it. But we ironically, do that. That's, that for me is the, it's the economy stupid. I've just had right. enough. And I mean, also just fatigue of the, of the Trump childish bullshit. And Biden today, I tried to think of any other, honestly, him being an old white man was perfect for the day. Right. Right. Because it was, well, it, it was, was funny. But I also say that as a white guy, it was this grandfatherly figure that was like, and I literally was like, oh my God. It's I like an Eisenhower where you're like, yeah. you yeah. feel kind of. Right. Like, well, and Biden, of course, has a unique credibility having been Barack Obama's vice president. And so, yeah. like, he can be kind of the old white guy saying these things because he was the vice president, the first right. black president we've ever had in our country. Right. But you're right about the – again, I said this the other week on TV. When I think about Donald Trump and the Republican Party, I think of, uh, you know, build the wall, Hillary's emails, drain the swamp, blame China. Very concise, often repeated – I, you know, forget about whether it's true or not or any of that. Right. That's Messaging. what that yeah. party is in three words or less. Yep. When I think about the Biden campaign and the Democratic Party, I don't know what those three words are. It, it could yep. be enough is enough, had enough. It could be no more fear. What, I, whatever you come up right. with, but they got to have something because it is, uh, you know, from a, again just a purely operative perspective. That's. You got you to gotta tell people, you know, what you're for. They got to know what they're buying into, and, and they got to have a theme. I mean, like any good movie, television show, you know, song, like there has got to be a story that, that, that your audience is buying into and rallying around. Uh, and you need to be able to say, to get them to think of that story by saying a couple words, right? right. It, it should elicit, like any good brand, you know, the few words needs it's to like, elicit that emotional you know, reaction. I've always said, if you've ever watched, you know, WWE, <laughs> and, and watch one, and watch. You know, it's like I always. If, if I ran a candidate school, I would make every single candidate running for any office watch old promos from The Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin, and and and, and watch how when they say one word, twenty thousand people in the arena finish that right. sentence because they know those catchphrases. Right. That's messaging. Yep. You know, I had you kind of scaring me here because I hadn't thought about that with Biden during two thousand sixteen. I remember uh, a reporter friend telling me. I know what Trump's for. As you said, it's the wall. It's um, the anti-Muslim thing. It was actually anti-Muslim and the wall were the two big ones and drain the swamp, like mm -hmm. you said. With Hillary, there were 10,000 proposals. And I mentioned this to Hillary people. They go, that's not true. She was for this and this and this. I'm like, no, you don't get it. Like, even I who work this, even top reporters I was talking to who were friends who were smart people, they couldn't quite mention the two or three things. And I hadn't thought about it, but you're right. With Biden, and honestly, the other candidates too. I love Elizabeth Warren. There were 10,000 things. And people, and people disagree. We say, no, Warren's for inequality across the board. Not, there isn't really a soundbite there. And mm -hmm. Biden doesn't have a soundbite. Now, I fear that, that the Biden folks probably worry that simply saying a return to normalcy or haven't you had enough isn't positive enough of an agenda. You know? Right. And certainly on right. the left, but people you can, don't like You can that. do more than one thing. And as, as Kurt was saying, the wall and you know they had lock her up and yeah. they had, you know oh, it's, it's like, like you can have a boom. couple things and yeah. that's what they need to do right they, they need you know i i think anything that gets it stability that gets it compassion and gets it an experience and you may want different words and whatever but they really should sort of those three things should be the 
the positives they should right. sort of and, you should and, get. And, and you know, and everyone associated with the campaign, every surrogate, every elected official, endorser needs to repeat those two or three you know catchphrases. Yes, really, we can as much as I mean, yeah, hope and change. Right. Yes, no, we but, can. But you're right. I mean, we you're right though. That's the Obama, and we remember it twelve years later. Biden and. and Tell Bush right. compassionate conservatism. I mean, yeah, like whatever yeah. it is, yeah, you got to have that. You, uh, yeah. HW thousand points of light. Uh, it's just these yeah. things are there, and, and it's such a central component from from a messaging standpoint, from mm-hmm. you know an image, from a theme uh, t- to connect with voters. And again, it's like just watch old WWE promos, man. They, they, they <laughs> you know, whether it's the Undertaker saying "Rest in peace" or The Rock saying "Do you smell what The Rock is cooking?" Like. It's there. Like I didn't actually this, realize that that they had all slogans and things. I don't watch, but yeah, like it's it, it's it's a you know it, it's one of the. I started watching some of this stuff and trying to figure out the Trump presidency and, and you know remembering Trump did this story arc with WWE back in the day, hmm. uh, and, and 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 I remember his convention speech when he walked out and had this backdrop and music and this dramatic. And it's like it was like straight out of a WWE WrestleMania entrance, right? Uh, everything you need to know about Donald Trump you, is, is literally ex- explained by watching Monday Night Raw, right. in my opinion. He is a character who is delivering you know, promos about beating his other guy into submission. And yep. you know, I mean, that, the, it's for, the Trump presidency is, is basically you know, the world wrestling entertainment put on steroids, right. you know, given nuclear launch codes. Yep. And they're memorable, by the way. They are. And it's why, maybe it's why Linda McMahon understands him so well and is such a big supporter. Right. You know, I mean, his former secretary of a small business there. And so I think that that's something that Democrats don't do well and, 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 you know, in, in contemporary times and haven't really tapped into and they need to of, of just basic messaging, understanding Trump's psyche about this. If you know, if you go into it knowing Trump thinks he's a WWE superstar, that's what you're up against. That's what you're dealing with on a debate stage, in speeches, at rallies, that in his mind, he's playing a, a WWF superstar, okay? That's how you can figure out how to deconstruct him and beat him. Hmm. Um, not by throwing out 45, uh, tw- you know, 20-page policy papers. That's just not going to get done. I like yep. that. I may be teaching a class in the fall in political communications. I may have to show people like WWE stuff. I, I, I'll funny. give you full credit, Kurt, if I do that. You can put a great reel together of WWE superstars screaming their slogans, interwoven with Trump screaming his slogans at rallies. Right. It'll sound the same. Right. I bet. That's really fascinating. It's a great um, point. Kurt, I know we're hitting up, I think, actually, I think you've given us more time than you promised. Uh, got any sort of maybe final thoughts on, you know, the news of the day, maybe, is, is the way to close. And then Kenneth and I are going to continue. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I just think that as a, you know, as a Democrat, you know, as someone who obviously wants this national nightmare to finally stop, uh, I think the most important thing for everyone to understand is as bad as things look and as bad as it looks every day on the news, um, you know, there, there, there is another side to that story. You know, what we're not seeing enough of are the, the, the law enforcement officials who are taking a knee with protesters. Uh, what we're not seeing enough of are, uh, like in Nashville, you know, when, when the police arrested this 25-year-old white kid who set a fire to a, to a historic building, uh, the police department oh, right. tweeted right. out his arrest right. you know, and made it very clear who was behind that. Um, you know, the, 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 for every act of, of violence and unrest we're seeing right now, there are 50 acts of kindness and generosity and compassion that are being demonstrated right now as well. And that's the real American spirit, that, that in the midst of, of a protest and unrest, if you actually stop and look around, you see people trying to help one another and, and, and to protect one another. Uh, and, and that always gives me optimism. Uh, you know, I always look for those moments when I'm watching coverage. Uh, and, and, and even when you, see, when you start seeing the, the, the smoke coming in and the rubber bullets flying, you always see someone trying to shield somebody else and, and taking someone to run with them and looking out for someone. And you know, that, that's, that's, that's America, in my opinion, that that's the best of America. And, and I think that there's more of them than there are of, 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 of the Trumps uh, and, you know, and, 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 and the disruptors and uh, the racists. And, and I think, and I do think that at, at the end of the day, that's going to win the day in November. I like it. I endorse this message, everyone. <laughs> no, that was great. <laughs> 
Thanks, Kurt. Yeah, I'm, all right, I'm feeling a little better. Thanks so much, Between man. you and Biden this morning, my mood is, has lifted. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's thanks, guys, dour. for having me on. I appreciated you reaching out to me, and no, I'm glad we got great. to do this. Thank Hopefully, you. we'll get to do it again soon. Absolutely. Absolutely. Someday, someday thanks for person. being here, man. Yep. All right, right take yeah. care. Bye, Kurt. You too. All right, Kurt's got There we go. And Cliff and I are still here. So, you know, yeah, so the Biden stuff this morning, I mean, it, 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 it God knows it made it me feel better. powerful too. as hell. I've been, feeling, you know? I've been feeling just awful the last few days. Everything's been freaking me out. You know, we had an incident in front of my place with some guys with sledgehammers who attacked the grocery Well, obviously, store. that's a little personally it's, scary, too. But I mean, so, no, but I'm I mean, saying, like, that got me even more revved up, you know, and then seeing the violence out there. And honestly, the last couple of months of coronavirus, I've already been anxiety ridden. Cliff and I have talked on the show you know, not being able to sleep at night and waking up three hours before and rolling in bed and, and, and then this week, you know, and it's, it was, Biden was like, just what I needed. It was just, but, in a, but you're in a way you're speaking to the, to the perfection of that message. Huh, and again, sense? I do think in the sense that like, you need something to make you feel better, yeah. to make you feel like we're going to get out of this, to make you think we're going to be at least somewhat more united again, right. that we're going to end some of to quote somebody, the American carnage, you know, and, yeah. and Biden gave you that feeling, which means he did a great job. I mean, again, I agree with Kurt and I think it will be coming. I, I hope so. Anyhow, where there'll be a couple of these slogans and catchphrases that, you know, you know, will, to use, but at least in general, the sense, yeah. you know, you said normalcy. I wrote a piece for the New York daily news on that, how he should run that kind of a campaign. Right. I mean, I'm not saying use that word. I would go again to me, the contrast between him and, and Trump that are most effective are stability because you're basically telling people Trump is, is crazy, which he is, right. you know, and you want that experience because Trump's completely incompetent, doesn't know what the hell he's doing. Compassionate because Trump's a sociopath. I might add a fourth one, trustworthy because right. Trump's an out and out liar. And you find, find ways within those four words to come up with two or three catchphrases that are positive for you. I think, and then you have to have your one or two negative catchphrases. I think even had enough, it maybe is one of them and you find another one. Right. you know, unfit or whatever it is. And, you know, you run with those and those should always signal to people the broader themes. But, but again, I think he was, I watched most of it this morning before I had to shower and get ready because I was going to be appearing in person on our podcast. Uh, but I thought he was, it was an incredible speech. So yeah. kudos to them. Yeah. No, but it is funny though. I mean, I'm glad Kurt mentioned that about the messaging because I honestly hadn't quite thought of that, that, we still don't have sound bites. And I, I think it's important Kurt mentioned it too, because I think there is the, even when Kurt was talking, I was agreeing with him and I was already thinking of people listening and going, what do you mean right. it's bad to have proposals? What do you mean it's bad? As I jumped in and said, what do you mean it's bad to care which healthcare proposal we get? That's not really the point. The point is, no. to, is if you want to win elections, you need to think of how you right. win elections and that's with messaging, which is the point you and I always well, bring Also, back. here's, and also, again, it's not an either or. So the whole thing you should be doing, I mean, Trump even did that with his stupid wall thing. Hmm. But the whole thing you should be doing is communicating what your policies are through these taglines, through these, because in, you'll be saying, you'll be letting, making it clear to people like what it is that you want to do right. if it's really good. So it's not that you shouldn't have policy yeah. proposals. It's that you shouldn't all the time be listing what your policy proposals are. You should have the shorthand of your branding and the your messaging state. to explain the deep sorry state. the deep state yeah of there there being examples of something trump takes every example practically of criminal malfeasance he's done and whenever he gets called out on it whether it's inspectors general whether it's comey whether it's Mueller, it's the deep state right i mean but that's yep. an example of what you're saying where you get these these uber concepts that you then tie everything into fake news Part of the reason it's worked is he keeps saying it for every occasion. And it also is a really good uh, overarching topic to explain any time a newspaper exposes something he did, it's fake news. So it's, right. it's, and again, you don't be dishonest like they are, but he's very, they're very good at this. Um, it's very good at the message. It's really, you know. Well, <laughs> but it also great. works when, yes. Well, it also uh, works when great. what? I said it also works when you have more simple minds and you don't have an interest in creating policy. So all you do is spend all your time creating slogans and for we want to school. create policy. Yeah. Right. We want to create policy too. It's just, they're not, it's not like either or it's, you yeah. can actually create good policy and then explain it to people in simple terms that brand who you are and what you stand for. Yeah. That's what we should be doing. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 
And I mean, you know, I also think there is a pr not a problem, but there is a difference where I think the left, and when I say the left, I mean the left of de liberal Democrats, whatever term you want to use, um, you know, that, right. that they, they, we, we like details more, right? Now, I must admit, I like- We have this strange attraction to reading, yes. Well, no, but quite seriously, though, I mean, like, I, I, I what one thing I liked about Pete Buttigieg were these overarching themes and that, that he would present. It made me, you know, this sort of Americana, something about it was uh, very heartwarming to me. And I, I don't know, a, a, a president who's thinking about, I, I don't know what it was. And some of the criticisms of Buttigieg, however, from people where they felt he wasn't detailed enough. So clearly, I'm also one of these people where even though I want details, I want a figurehead. Figure yeah, I know what going. you're saying. And he definitely fits into the more, and Biden, frankly, did that today as well. Biden had really did the, you know, the pathos, whatever you want to call it, the empathy. The yeah, no, there was good yes. language in that. He Absolutely. was the fucking president today. He did. And Trump never does. It's, no, it was very, uh, but yeah, but talk a little bit more about last night, Cliff, because it really, it's, and you know what's funny too, it almost, okay, today, I forget what it was, the, uh, uh, Secret Service or the Park Service or somebody's Park Service, I think, put out a statement saying, oh, no, we when we cleared that church yesterday, it had nothing to do with Trump coming in half an hour. Now, now just That's what can't say either is how much he corrupts everybody else around him. It yeah. makes them lie for him. Yeah. Now, let's just... I mean, the Park Service are, are troops that belong to our government. Yeah. You know, our well, federal government. they're not government. troops, but yeah. <laughs> not troops, okay. That's, uh, but they do have police, word. but they do have police, yeah. They are police that belong to our federal government. And so he used federal government resources to attack and disperse an innocent group of, you know, a, 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 a peaceful group of people who were protesting him. It was not, there was no threat. There was no anything. He wanted to walk to the church for his, his uh, photo op. And I'm sure he also wanted to have images of him attacking protesters because he does think that'll right. work for him. And quite frankly, it probably does have the best chance of working for him because nothing else will. Right. You know, and so he has to divide to have even a shot. So, I mean, you know, I mean, it was all just so disgusting. And again, yeah. every once in a while, I just get this feeling like that, that feeling like from what you learn history in school and whatever. And you're taught about like this sort of disgustingness of fascism, you know, where something feels like where you start having that feeling in the pit of your stomach, like this isn't what you do in a democracy and using federal police to to clear a park so that he could take a photo op and, and potentially injuring or killing people. I don't think I mean, anybody was killed. Right. I'm not sure if anybody was seriously injured, but I mean, it could, they could have been. To do that, I mean, it's just, it's such an unbelievable abuse of power. It deserves impeachment in and of itself. Right. Um, and and, and, and I, so, just real quick though, the one point I wanted to make too was just as you and you and me both being insiders on this, it's an outright, it, we know it is a lie that when the Park Service says, we didn't clear it because Trump was going to speak. Right. When the president is going to arrive at an event, I went to see Bill Clinton speak at Howard University when he was president. We had to get there two hours early because they had the entire event venue locked down. Nobody could come in, nobody could come. They said, if you're not there two hours before his speech, right. the doors are locked closed. If the president is going to be in public on a street corner- The Secret alone, Service preps everything, so does the, I mean- And they prep down. it, well, no, they prep it way in advance. And if you're doing it in a time where there are A, protests, and B, there's been violence, blame, yep. blame the far right, blame whoever you want, but there's been violence. And frankly, somebody lit that church on fire last night, and it could have been far right provocateurs, but you're putting him in a place where somebody tried to commit arson. You yes. are going to sweep that area before he comes. So even if they claim, well, at 630, we didn't sweep the area with violence because Trump was speaking at 7. At 635, they would have had to sweep the area with violence because Trump was coming at 7. Like, That's correct. They're just, they're outright lying about their own procedure. And, and I wish to some degree somebody could go back to the Park Service and say, no, you know what? I've got my camera on in front of you, Mr. Park Service head. You explain to me. So you're saying... You wouldn't have cleared the area at all for the president to walk there at seven o'clock? Really? And watch right. him. In other words, uh, you're a liar. He's lying. He's lying about the procedure. And it's, it's, an, it's a Trump quality lie because it's such a clear lie on its face that even the procedures contradict what he's claiming. It's not just we know in our gut he's lying. They would have had to clear the area if the right. president's going there and they would have gotten violent with people because they, they would have said we're not leaving. I mean, yes. 
you know. It's just, it's, it's very yeah, straightforward. He corrupts everything. He corrupts everything. He does. Because he you threatens know. people and makes everybody lie for him. And then well, they and, have to think about, do they want to lose their job and their pension and their this and their that? Is it yeah. worth it? You know, I mean, he's just an awful human. Well, and I think, but I think God, he did a bad job of it. I think ironically for Trump, he did a shitty job. He talked to the Rose Garden and that's kind of what he wanted though. I think Trump wanted to talk in the Rose Garden and they did split screens on TV. And, you know, you and I, I'm sure you predicted it in your own head when it was going. I did in mine. And Trump's people did too. They're going to be showing us and then they're going to show these guys beating up the protesters. And you're going to talk about law and order. And it's going to be great. America's streets are carnage. I'm there to help, right? Well, but then he goes to the church and like we said, he totally blew it. He went for the photo op. He didn't say, a, he, he did, not only did he not pray, not only did he not talk about the arson, right. he literally didn't say anything. He, he gave no speech. He, gave, he didn't even do questions with reporters. He just got there, stood in front of the church, and the church was boarded up. He held a Bible like it was a dirty diaper and like took a picture. With he held friends. a Bible, didn't mention why he was holding a Bible. And, well, and actually, with all the other white people in his administration. Well, Cliff, okay, all the white people. And what he also fucked up was they were literally on the steps of the church. So the picture frame was Trump and half a doorway with wood on it. Yeah, you couldn't see the church. church. I know. Yeah. That's what was hilarious. They should have been, they should have been, I don't know, 15, 20 feet further in front, uh, away from the church. So then people would have been like, They don't prep anything. There's no advance for them. Like, it's not a professional organization. It's what he's always been. But, it's just but an it's, amateur yeah. ad hoc, you know, from one minute to the next. Yeah. That's his whole life. Literally the that. Bible thing. I mean, the Bible thing was literally, you know, th- this is my, this is my modern, gr- by the way, great book for learning Greek. But this is my Trump holding the Bible like this. And they're like, and my favorite was when they said, oh, was that a, is that your Bible? And he goes, it's a Bible. A Bible was what he said. <laughs> well, again, and the response is. Because clearly why, it's not his. But again, that fucking reporter clip, the response is, oh, why didn't you bring your Bible? Yeah, of no, course. No, but. he'd make up some lie about it, but he doesn't have a Bible. I would no, have of said, course. Oh, that's interesting. When we get back to the White House, can we see your Bible? That would be a really neat photo op. I know, really. Watch him, and he's going to bring it and say, can, now, by the way, then he'd have a Bible in his hand, the saying that it's his, and it'd say, great, can I see the first page where it says property of or whatever? No. They I mean, never, of course, they don't call him on, on any freaking like liar. That. But to hold the Bible like this, like it's, like it's, you know, burning his, of course, it probably was burning his hands, but, you know. <laughs> Yes. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. But um, what else? We're going to have to do another ad really quick, um, which, by the way, kind of screwed up a little, folks. I apologize. We wanted to make this one of our premium episodes, and the premium episodes mean we've got to do all the ads in the first part, and we didn't do, so this is going to be another – this is going to – well, I, but I apologize because I don't want to – I don't want the, the Zoom epi- – let me put it this way. The Zoom episodes make it a lot uh, – our our – are for you guys, the subscribers, and it makes it a lot harder to do the ads and cut them out and do only tidbits for the public when we do Zoom. So I think when we do Zoom, it's gonna be a little more public-y, so I apologize for that. Um, I mean, meaning not just putting it behind the firewall. There's not Now, um, I don't know, anything else, Cliff, in the news? The thing is that obviously this is, you know, well, yeah, we hit 100,000 100, people with coronavirus. I mean, that I mean, obviously got blown out of the- That news. was a big story, and then of um, course got pushed out by some of this stuff. You know, and I do worry, I will say, I do worry, I wasn't worrying the first couple of days until somebody mentioned it maybe two nights ago. I hope to God that with the protests, we're not just spreading the virus further. I'm hoping that everything being public and it being warm out, that maybe we get lucky, you know, but it's, it, it's got me scared um, that that's another, just I mean, that. I, again, hope to I God. think with it, you know? yeah, I do worry. I mean, again, all of these protests, uh, I, mean, I get whether necessary. Oh, oh, it's not. I'm not questioning whether. But I wasn't worried about the health aspects saying. until a couple of days ago when somebody, somebody actually, real quick, I'm sorry, but somebody had said to me, "Hey, why aren't you going down there?" And it was a day that was really hot as hell, and we hadn't had as much violence yet. And I just said, "You know, it's a really shitty day, and I can't Uber down anymore because I'm afraid of using Ubers with the virus." So it's a, really a hell of a walk. And then the next day, somebody mentioned to me the uh, the virus, and I went. Oh God, I wasn't even thinking about that. I don't want to be. And then, like, then we I started. I can't balance all the damn, you know. Well, shit and then we down. started having the police violence. And then I started thinking, holy shit, I don't want to get beaten up. And with my asthma, the last thing, I can't even imagine what tear gas would do to asthma. Yeah, so then I got I mean, scared about the whole thing and said, all right, I'm not going down there to take pictures, <laughs> even though I really is, wanted I mean, to go it's, cover it's it. It's a risk. You know? I mean, that's the thing, you know? Um, anyway, I don't know. Nothing I, we can I, do I about hope. it. There's nothing we can do. I mean, I hope it seemed I like hope. at least where I was seeing most protesters were wearing masks. There been a lot but of, of course, masks there were some people that weren't, you know, and I, I hope because that's the most dangerous. It, outdoors, at least, is good. 
Yeah, but when you're in, cl- in up close to somebody and screaming yeah. and yelling, that's when you're more likely yeah. to have droplets. Well, and you're, going you're into touching the air. each other, you're jostling, you're helping your person, and you're touching. And even though they said uh, touching is as much transition uh, transmission, it's still, you know, we're going to see. I, I, read something, I read something about in China, only 2% of the cases might have been transmissible by touch. So, you know, we can hope. And, and actually, very few of them were outdoors. Outside. Yeah, very but, few outdoors. So, anyway, we'll hope. But there's nothing we can do about it. But it's just something I started worrying about, you know, and, and yeah. obviously with the virus overall, you know, we'll see. I mean, this, I don't know. I mean, all of this worries me because now I'm worried about the economy too, because even like in DC, the businesses are shut down. A lot of businesses are shut down preemptively too. Ugh. I was walking around because I had to go to my, my allergy shot yesterday. So I saw a lot of places that were looted, but also a lot of places that just have put up planking just to protect their businesses because they don't want to get looted or broken down or broken into whatever. And you know, we just started opening up with our own phase one with outdoor restaurants and things like that. And it just, anyway, it worries me too, because I, I, I worry about the economic impact of all of this, especially to the places that get looted. And I hate to keep bringing it up, but it's 200 jobs gone at a shot for a lot of these businesses. And it just, no, I know it just, it's again, not saying the protest shouldn't no happen. Good answers. That's what I mean. There's just no good answer. I just, it's, but it's heightened, it's heightening my anxiety about so much going wrong right I now. I understand that. That that I would feel better about, not better about the protest, but I'd feel better if at least it also weren't scaring me about the pandemic and the economy. It's like we've had a quadruple whammy of bad shit going on and they're all reinforcing each other. And right. frankly, and it all it's Donald back Trump, Trump. Like there's no reason you know? to think, yeah. right, being that it's him, there's no reason yeah. to think there won't be, that won't turn into a yeah. quintuple yeah. or a sextuple. Yep. Yeah. Well, you know what too, by the way, a democratic White House, Democratic White House wouldn't have, you know, caved to protesters. A Democratic White House would have from, I mean, and Trump, by the way, even, they even claimed they were going to investigate the uh, George Floyd killing, which ironically that that didn't even resonate, but not ironically, it didn't resonate because it's Donald Trump. And frankly, well, yeah, because he said things left and right that he never follows up on. That's what I mean. mean, In some ways, when he says bad shit, like he said last night about sending federal troops in, the only yeah. thing we have going for us is he, he, he's too lazy to do the things he actually threatens to yeah. do. Well, and even last night, I'd be, I'm really curious if Trump can give them orders like that. Can he? Uh, can he I mean, give them orders and say, and say, forget him going to the church. I don't want them there. Push them back three blocks. It, it, if, this, if, the, if the governors and mayors don't cooperate, it's very dicey as to whether he can do it legally um, DC though, I mean, where where he's got DC is different. Right? He's got the That's park the police. Problem. He's got the Secret Service. Uh, well, DC is not a state. Out. That's the problem. Yeah. Not being a full state, you don't yeah. have the rights, which is bullshit. And of course, but I mean, but you have a president me, literally, but... literally decide the tactics on the ground. Again, forget about him going to the church. Literally say, you know what? I don't like it. I want them back three blocks, them back four blocks, and I want you to use tear gas. I mean, right. first of all, it's I'm sure. Not I'm sure, Nixon is another story, but it hasn't happened with any president probably in four four decades, five decades. Whereas with him, I'm sure he'd be glad to do it. And in the end, these agency heads would do it. You know, which is the problem going forward. He's gonna just say, he's gonna love it. He's and actually talk about wag the dog. Like you said, he's gonna want more violence because he thinks it's- That is, he likes it. He knows he's a sociopath, he enjoys it. You know? He gets this. He's he's like a a, a a torture porn guy. He gets this weird thrill. Yeah. God, you hear so it when he announces weird. those troops ran into the fire and yeah. they're getting torn apart. I mean, he's just, just he's so just bad. very sick individual. And if you saw Rick Rennell was arguing with uh, um, what's her face, who's really Swalwell. Uh, Swalwell just fucking owned him. Oh, I did know, he? Well, I, saw I saw Jackie Kucinich. What did he do with Swalwell? Oh, I didn't see that. Swalwell just kicked his ass. Go find it. It was all him trying to deny. You know that that anything had been done wrong with with respect to Flynn and so oh, like that is I did see when you those, took over yes. the job. You said you were going to release the, the the call transcripts and you haven't done it. So clearly, you know, and and, and right. all Grinnell could do is just be his defensive dick self. Like he had nothing. He's a Twitter troll. Nothing. I mean, He's, I know him. He's yes. a Twitter troll. He's, uh, yeah, yeah. They, yeah. They they took a Twitter troll, and made him Don ambassador Jr. to one of the most important. Rick Grinnell is Don Jr. And, with a bigger brain. Right, and okay. they turned him into made him the ambassador to one of the most important countries and the and the head of intelligence in the interim. <laughs> Which is even, even a Twitter troll. ambassadorial job. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's no, it's criminal. It's just part of the crime. I, I, you know, and it takes us back to that discussion, which we can close soon, but it takes us back to that discussion of, of Biden doesn't have a choice, but to focus on the kleptocracy when he comes in. And it's, it's, and it's not just the kleptocracy because it's not just about 
Trump qua Trump, as we say in the law, meaning his own crimes. Right. It's, we have seen so many flaws. I'm not even getting into police brutality flaws. I'm talking way more uh, larger systemic flaws in sure. that, in that somebody can so abuse the system and the police are pretty That's correct. I mean, even like the things that were that are that one might consider smaller things the hatch act for example like yeah. they've never been prosecuted yeah. they've it ignored just, it like it doesn't exist yeah. they send yeah. out political stuff on the white house twitter account they've got people acting in their yeah. formal roles for the president saying political things i mean it's a constant yeah. and they never once so i mean the whole point is if you never enforce that then people are never going to listen to yeah. it nothing's, you know? been like they, these, nothing's been enforced these laws on have anything to be made they have and to what be do you, made yeah. tougher. They have to be made yeah. almost automatic. They have yeah. to, I mean, there, there's, it's not just the police that needs reform. The Justice Department needs enormous reform. Uh, well, I mean, I, you know, and you know what? we've got a lot put, ahead yeah. of us. And let me put a finer point on it, Cliff. You know, clearly people are very worried now about what's coming next, not just for Trump's violence, but also, you know, a literal, God, it sounds crazy. Don Lemon said it last night, but about a, you know, a, a dictatorship taking over. I mean, I believe that was the word he used. Like, I, I feel stupid almost using the word because it seems so anathema to what it means to be an American, right? It's crazy. Oh, this is cute. Uh, you know, it, that, it's anathema that, um, uh, sorry, I was getting a call on the phone and it distracted me. I, I, brr, I hate that. Um, the, uh, uh, the dictatorship Trump, oh yeah. It is clear to us that, Trump could go much further than this and still get away with it. That is correct. And what worries me then is what kind of laws do you put in place to stop that from happening? That's what I need Biden to do. Even if it isn't throwing Trump in jail, it is we now see what Trump could be. I mean, we always Well, do. we now see what Tom Cotton or Liz Cheney yeah. or some of these other ghouls could be in the future. Yes. Who and clearly aspire to be president. From and that's what I mean where I'm saying it's not just about throwing Trump in jail as Trump. It's we see how he could become a violent dictatorship. I know, folks, you're saying he already is. That's not my, my point is literally Eastern European Soviet dictatorship. We see how it could happen. And I want yep. to know what kind of laws can be put in place to stop that from happening. That is something Joe Biden has to do, even if he can't, even if he feels like he can't do the prosecuting the Trump family, prosecuting Bill Barr aspect of it. He's got to look at how do we literally save America? And it's not just going to be healing race relations. That's part of it. It's literally this. We got to find a phrase for it. Click. I was going to say the dictatorship part, but we need a phrase for it of, of defining how we, how we never let anybody do this. It's never again is the phrase used for the Holocaust and uh, you know, World War II and other, the Russians use it as well, I believe, for, you know, for the, the way they got it. You know, well, once they, once they became anti-Nazi, they were pro-Nazi at the beginning. Well, but, we, have to, you know, we have to find uh, something you know, like to, that. Because, yes. Also because, and actually branding-wise, Cliff, we don't want it to sound like we're talking about just uh, vindictiveness. No, exactly I agree. It. Yeah. It, has to be, it, has to, it doesn't mean this. you ignore all they've done. I think they need to be prosecuted. How do we That's save democracy in this country so that it never right. happens again, so that nobody, nobody pushes us this close to losing our democracy and the rest of us literally sit here and go, I don't even know what the fuck to do. You know, yeah. Short of rioting in the streets, what the fuck do you do to fight this guy? That's, 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 not hel that's also not healthy in a democracy because then, as a friend of mine was telling me yesterday who uh, knows a lot about Latin America, uh, you, you know this as well uh, from your international relations studies. When you don't give people, and this applies to also the race issue and everything else, when you don't give people an outlet, and frankly, this could even apply to the far right and those guys too. When people feel politically that they have no outlet for their concerns, they resort to violence because there's nothing else. That's correct. You know, that you the don't whole have point of democracy is that, is that you include everybody and there's ballots instead of bullets. Yep, and it gives you people an outlet have for your concerns. Well, I mean, when people feel they have no other recourse to having yep. being addressed, they'll, yep. they'll get yep. desperate. Whether they're good people or bad people. You know, no, in any good case. people get desperate too. If you're hungry, yep. you yep. know, whatever. In any case. In any case, okay. I, I'm, I've said no, all good. that I have on my mind. I did too. That was a good, I'm looking here. Oh, that was a good hour and a half, possibly. And even with the ads. Yep. But um, I think we're good. What did we do? Tuesday. Okay, yeah. So we'll, so I, you know, again, as usual, we'll do Thursday or Friday. I don't know. Maybe we'll do one yeah, of our I have regular a couple, podcasts. Couple folks see. who we could probably book. Oh, good. So uh, good. we'll talk about it. Okay, this was good though. Yeah, no, I always want to think would be so. perfect actually for the moment. So well, actually, that's I'll a very good question. We'll, we'll talk offline because yeah, it might be interesting to see if we can get somebody who's uh, 
exactly timely for the moment. Oh, actually, you know what? And David Frum has a new book, Trumpocalypse, that is well, quite we interesting. We have to we, have him on at some point. Well, we I should get so him many... on. I've been, he's been quite interesting uh, analyzing the current moment on TV the last few days. But I also so, like to hear from some of my former friends, you know, who obviously <laughs> enjoy having oh, yeah. uh, David Frum on our show so much. Yeah, so they can all get upset at the fact that, that I'm the one who actually brought David into the show and that Cliff is blamed for being his best friend. I know, it's awesome. Owning the left. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, what but, do you do? In any case, I, I'll talk to you, but I've got, I've got one or two people that are absolutely okay. perfect for right now. Okay, good. All right, guys, then um, we're going to sign off. I'm going to, in a couple hours, well, not a couple hours, you'll be seeing this once it's done anyway. So I'm going to go, I'm going to have some food because I'm stuck. That damn me Omaha State really commercial go got me I'm like, so damn I want hungry. some meat now. Um, me too. I need to go eat. So go turn on the TV and make sure the world isn't, hasn't ended yet. Right. That's important because then there's no point really editing the podcast. That's the good thing. You always find a, a, a rainbow I, in, the, in the darkness. The glass is half full. <laughs> the glass is half full. The world might have ended. Hey, don't have to edit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Bye, All guys. right, guys. Thanks for listening.